Today we're gonna drive Euler's incredibly awesome infinite product form for the sine function. And for that we need an infinite series expansion for the cotangent function around its poles. Its poles being of the form z equal to k times pi where k is some integer. Now I have derived such a series expansion for the cotangent function, but the problem is in the derivation of that series expansion, I used Euler's infinite product for the sine function as a starting point. So that's a bummer because for this video, we want to prove that infinite product form. So we have to come up with a different way to derive the required series expansion for the cotangent function. And that other way is using Fourier series. So we're gonna employ Fourier series, we're gonna derive the Fourier series for this function f of x equal to the cosine of t times x, where t is some real number that's not an integer, and x belongs to this interval between negative to positive pi. And once we have the series expansion, we'll work our way forward towards Euler's infinite product form. So without further delay, let's determine the Fourier coefficients. Starting off with a naught by two, a naught by two is defined as one by two L times the integral from negative L to positive L of the function f of x dx. Now f of x here is the cosine of t times x and we have to integrate it from negative pi to positive pi and we're multiplying by the reciprocal of two pi. Now the cotangent function is an even function, so instead of integrating from negative to positive pi, we could just integrate from zero to pi and double the result. So the twos cancel out pretty nicely, and this implies that a naught by two equals the integral from zero to pi, terribly sorry about that, uh, times one by pi of the cosine of tx dx. And this sorts out to the sine of tx divided by t, with the limits being zero and pi. Now in the limit as x approaches pi, you get the sine of t times pi divided by t times pi. And as x approaches zero, you get sine of zero, which is of course zero. So that's a naught by two sorted out. Next up, we're gonna turn our attention towards the b sub k terms. But before that, notice that the half interval length here is pi, so you're dividing by pi, and the pi terms up here cancel out, and this implies that f of x equals a naught by two plus the sum over the positive integers k of a sub k times the cosine of kx plus b sub k times the sine of kx, and this is pretty convenient for the b sub k terms. Why is that so? Well, b sub k is defined as one over the half interval length, which is pi, times the integral from negative pi to positive pi in this case, and the function f of x is the cosine of tx, and you have to multiply it by this sine kx term, integration with respect to x. Now, cosine even function, sine odd function. Odd function times even function gives you odd function, and you're integrating an odd function on a symmetric interval. So that means this just sorts out to zero. And all the bk terms are just zero, which is again, pretty convenient. And now for the a sub k terms. Well, a sub k is defined in a similar manner. You have this reciprocal of half the interval length, which is pi integral from negative pi to positive pi of the cosine of tx, which is your function f of x. But this time it's being weighted by the cosine of kx, and cosine times cosine is an even function, so instead of integrating from negative to positive pi, just integrate from zero to pi and double the result. And there are a few ways to evaluate this integral that for reference purposes, I'm gonna call i. There are a few ways to evaluate it. For example, you could use those product to sum formulae or those complex exponentials, but the best root is integration by parts, and let me show you why. So I'm gonna differentiate the cosine of tx term, and I'll integrate this cosine of kx term. So on differentiation, I have negative t times the sine of tx, and here I have positive sine kx divided by k. And one more time, uh, negative t squared times cosine tx 
And here I have negative cosine kx divided by k squared, and that should suffice because the last row has two cosines, just as your inic row i. And of course, you have these alternating plus and minus signs. And look what happens when we apply the limits of integration, that is, when we apply 0 to pi. So these two have to be multiplied by each other, right? And in the limit as x approaches 0, the sine term will approach 0. And in the limit as x approaches pi, you get sine of k times pi. And we know that k is some integer. So sine of k times pi is 0. And this entire term just collapses to 0, which is nice. Next up, we have t times sine tx times this cosine kx term. And here we should get something. Yeah, we definitely will. So this implies that i equals this negative t times sine tx term multiplied by the cosine of kx divided by k squared, the limits being 0 and pi. And again, these two negatives cancel out. And you have this plus sign outside anyway. So plus integral from 0 to pi of t squared by k squared is a constant. And you're left with cosine tx times the cosine of kx dx. And notice that this integral is, in fact, our target integral i. So this implies that we can write this as i equal to, wait, we can write this here as t squared by k squared times i. So we can write the left-hand side as 1 minus t squared by k squared times i equal to what exactly? Well, in the limit as x approaches 0, the sine term collapses to 0, and the entire thing collapses to 0. And as x approaches pi, you have this negative t times the sine of t times pi. Remember, t was a t is a real number that's not an integer. And the cosine of k times pi is negative 1 to the k. And you can just absorb this negative 1 into this negative 1 to the k and make it negative 1 to the k plus 1. And we're dividing by k squared. So on simplification, you get i equal to t times the sine of t times pi times negative 1 to the k plus 1 divided by the k squared terms cancel out. And you're left with k squared minus t squared. So that's the integral i. And this integral i was related to the a sub k terms by 2 divided by pi multiplied by the integral i. So this implies that a sub k equals 2 by pi times negative 1 to the k plus 1 times t times the sine of t times pi divided by k squared minus t squared. Okay, so we have all the Fourier coefficients, and now we can finally expand the cosine of tx in terms of its Fourier series, and that starts off with this a0 by 2 term, and that is sine of t pi divided by t pi plus the sum over the positive integers k of these a sub k terms, that's 2 divided by pi, times negative 1 to the k plus 1 times t times sine t pi, divided by k squared minus t squared times the cosine of kx. And all the sine terms vanish because b sub k equals 0. OK, cool. And now I'm going to let x equal pi. And we're going to evaluate these series over there. So this implies on the left hand side, you have the cosine of t times pi equal to sine t pi divided by t pi plus Let's take all the constant terms outside. So 2 divided by pi times sine t uh, times t times sine t pi times the sum over k of negative 1 to the k plus 1 divided by k squared minus t squared. And the cosine of k times pi is negative 1 to the k. So multiply out the two negative 1 terms. You get negative 1 to the 2k plus 1. 2k plus 1 is an odd integer, so you have negative 1 in the numerator. So let me just replace this with a negative sign. OK, cool. And this is pretty nice because you can factor out this sine t pi term and multiply both sides by its reciprocal. 
So that gives us cosine t pi divided by sine t pi on the left-hand side. And this equals the cotangent of t times pi. And on the right-hand side, you have the reciprocal of t pi minus 2 divided by pi times t times the sum over k of 1 by k squared minus t squared. And this is a pretty cool series expansion, but we're not done with it just yet. I'm going to perform a transformation of variables by letting t times pi equal to some other variable, let's call it z. So this implies that the cotangent of z equals 1 by z, oh terribly sorry about that, minus 2 divided by pi times uh, t. Well, this equation implies that t divided by pi would be what exactly z divided by pi squared, right? So you have 2z by pi squared times the sum over k of 1 by k squared minus uh, t is replaced by z squared by pi squared. And you can expand this term here using pi squared. And this pi squared term cancels out the one outside pretty nicely. And this implies that you finally have the cotangent of z equal to 1 by z minus 2z times the sum over k of 1 by pi squared k squared minus z squared, which is a pretty awesome looking series expansion. And now for the second part of the video where we're going to use this series expansion to derive the infinite product form for the sine function. Now we want to translate this infinite series representation of the cotangent function into an infinite product representation of the sine function that seems like a pretty extravagant goal. And the way we're going to achieve this goal is pretty cool. So first up, I want to add negative 1 by z to both sides. So I have cotangent z minus 1 by z equal to the sum over k of negative 2z divided by pi squared k squared minus z squared. And is it really a 505 video if there isn't any integration involved? Not at all. That's why I'm integrating from 0 to x with respect to z. So on the left-hand side, this cotangent function sorts out to a log of sine z on integration, and 1 by z gives us log z. And the limits are 0 and x. And of course, using the properties of the logarithm, you can write this as log sine z divided by z. And the limits are, again, 0 and x. And on the right-hand side, you can switch up the order of the summation and the integration operators because we know that the sum is convergent. So we have to integrate from 0 to x, negative 2z divided by pi squared k squared minus z squared dz which is another logarithmic structure. But first, what about the limits on the left-hand side? Well, in the limit as x approaches, oh, sorry about that. In the limit as z approaches x, you get log sine x by x. And in the limit as z approaches 0, we know that sine x by x approaches 1. So you have negative log 1, and log 1 is just 0, so we're going to just ignore that. And on the right-hand side, you have the sum over k of log pi squared k squared minus z squared, where the limits are 0 and x. And this gives us, on evaluation of the limits, log pi squared k squared minus x squared minus log pi squared k squared. And again, using the properties of the logarithm, you can write this as the sum over k of log pi squared k squared minus x squared divided by pi squared k squared. And on simplification of the argument, you can, of course, write this as 1 minus x squared divided by pi squared k squared. Again, I want to invoke the properties of the logarithm. You have the sum of individual logarithms, so you can just combine them all into the logarithm of a product, so this infinite series turns into the logarithm of an infinite product over the uh, positive integers k 
of 1 minus x squared by pi squared k squared. Wow, that is extremely cool. And on the left-hand side, you have this log sine x by x term. So exponentiating gives us sine x by x equal to the infinite product over the positive integers k of 1 minus x squared divided by pi squared times k squared. And this is just beautiful. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.